Harris. Okay, uh, third interview now with uh, AJ by himself this time without yeah. Mary. Yeah. And uh, this uh, interview is called The Real Life and Purpose of Jesus. Okay, first we're going to start with the confusion, what I've called the confusion of your life and your teachings and the reason for this. <laughs> yeah. Over the last 2,000 years, I googled and found out that there, uh, there are now over 3,800 um, different denominations of Christian religion. Of Christian religion. <laughs> so it's apparent that there is a bit of confusion as to what is important. And disagreement. <laughs> and disagreement, yeah. <laughs> Um, and historically, sometimes their disagreements got quite intense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you've stated that much of the biblical account of your life and teachings are false, inaccurate, not complete, misinterpreted, and in some cases even deliberately deleted. Yeah, and deliberately modified in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I've said that probably the first attempt to get a consensus in the Christian world as we know it was the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD yeah. by the Roman Emperor Constantine, yeah. who you've described as a fairly violent man. Well, he uh, he had he had large aspirations to power, of course, and um, as did most Roman emperors. But also, he was quite a clever man, so he could see that the fragmentation of, of the Roman Empire was a, not only just about uh, secular issues, but also about religious issues. And so he wanted to pull the Roman Empire back into a one, one empire, and he felt the way to do that is by unifying politics with religion. So he invited about, it says about 1,800 bishops from the Altogether. Roman Empire, yep. and about... 300 turned up, showed up. That's correct, yeah. The but, rest were all upset <laughs> with the whole concept. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, the, many of the ones who were upset with the whole concept never came and therefore got never, never got included in the, mm. in the final decisions. Mm. And even, even the end result, the end result was not what you'd call a democratic process. No, no, not at all. And, in fact, uh, many of the times... Um, there was quite strong bickering even amongst the final decision makers um, as to what they should include in the canon, the Bible canon, and also what they should inc include as to what are the primary doctrines of Christianity. So there was often quite a lot of discord and, and quite murderous intent at times between the mm. people who were present. Yeah. Now the main issue there seemed to be the divinity of Christ. Yes, uh, a concept that had slowly developed after my death because no one after my death could mirror my condition. And so they then started the, the concept among even just general Christians who followed the basic teachings of Christianity that I taught. They started to consider that perhaps it wasn't possible for the average person to ever become divine in the sense that I was teaching. And so what they finished up doing was modifying quite a number of the uh, teachings to suit their new concept that it was impossible for them to become divine as I, I had encouraged them to become. So mm -hmm. they, they started to infiltrate the teachings with these concepts that it wasn't, that there was something unique and special about myself that, that others could not mirror. And eventually that grew into, into... And there was also other issues of competition with other people who were the so-called gurus of different religions of part, in times past. Mm. And they, they finished up amalgamating, in fact, many... And, and absorbing many of the concepts that surrounded the, the legends about those particular people mm. into my life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. To create God on earth. Yeah. Was this to appease the Jews? Was this to get on side with the Jews? No, it was a, to it, relate. To there them? was an attempt to appease almost every other religious faith. So, mm. um, so not just the Jews, but also uh, many of the uh, teachings of Hinduism and Buddhism uh, and other religions were all attempted to inco be incorporated. Or the the founders of such religions, I was compared to the founders of those religions. And when it was found my life was too ordinary, my life was then modified 
to suit the uh, to be competitive with the founders of those particular faiths. Okay, so so even in three hundred years, you had been elevated to a state of godlike status. Yeah, well, it, that that occurred very shortly after my death, actually. So so even in the first hundred years, um, this elevation of myself mm. into a, sort of like a godlike state. That, that then was unattainable by anyone else, mm. um, was something that was presumed and uh, then got incorporated into the copyists' revisions of the... Because, of course, every, every, the, the way the Bible was copied, all the manuscripts were copied at the time, were by hand, mm. and then uh, the teachings of the copyist would often be reflected in the modification he would make to the text. He, he would mm. say, oh, it couldn't say that because that doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. So, so he'd put in a word or two here and there, and uh, now it makes more sense to me, I can get that now. And then the next copyist would do the same, and the next copyist would do the same. And then, of course, there were many emotions involved for, for many of the so-called priesthood or the ministers of the, of mm. the faith that got incorporated into those copies. And, and by 300 years later, there was a gross distortion of what I really taught. Yeah. incorporated into the so-called canon. Yeah. So the synoptic gospels, as they're described, yep. Matthew, Mark and Luke, yep. they were written about 40 years after your death, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And John about 60 AD. Yeah. Which of those is possibly the more accurate? Well, they all contain inaccuracies, unfortunately, because... Um, because what the way in which the, the original texts were actually quite accurate account, uh, recount, accounting. So, so for example, I, I only met Luke once in my life on Earth, and he was only six years of age. So when Luke um, put together his gospel, he was actually going by first-hand interview experiences with other people who he, he went back to Israel to interview. And of course, he had the first-hand uh, account available for, of Mary, my, my partner, Mary Magdalene. So, because Mary, uh, he married my daughter, um, Luke married my daughter Sarah. So, he had the first-hand experience of my of my soulmate to to get a lot of his material. So, what he wrote was relatively accurate at the time. However, that also got distorted through this process of copying revisionists and so forth. So, what they originally wrote was quite accurate, but. But unfortunately, due to the changes that were made and so forth, by the time the Council of Nicaea came along, there were already quite a lot of strong distortions as well. And the, the three synoptic Gospels, the theologians have said that they're possibly, the three of them were copied from another source, which they call Q. Yeah, which is actually my soulmate. <laughs> Explain. Well, Mary was still alive, and Mary was the person who knew the most about my teachings that I gave while I was on earth and and but but there were a lot of problems that the the disciples around her had actually exposing to the world that she was still alive because because the Roman army was still on the lookout for Mary, they wanted to kill her still, they wanted to kill my child and so and so the disciples all were trying to keep Mary's identity and also oh, safety okay. uh, in play constantly. And so what, what that meant was that Mary, who had the most widest knowledge of my life and also the greatest knowledge of myself and my own personality and so forth, mm. um, knew these other disciples, of course, knew Matthew, knew Mark and even knew Luke because she, he, she was our son-in-law. Mm. And so um, all of these people could go back to Mary and actually get um, the material from her as just to, verbally did she write just verbally yeah okay. just verbally and get the material from her and and so that that is the source that it was the primary source of mm. information after my death about my life and what actually did happen mm. mary was the primary source but of course that happened through a process of interviews and so forth with her and mm. you know, spending time with her and finding out and, so how, and so forth. how long did she actually live she lived an additional 30, nearly 30 years after my passing. Um, and she was, she was tortured to death by the Roman army who eventually caught up with her in southern France. Mm. And she died in southern France, yeah. And this, as part of the persecution of Christians? 
Um, no, more a gen- more a specific focus on finding my partner, my my the person who I was married to. And why why did they have that issue when you were you were out of the way now? You weren't stirring up the the pot. Well, what the original feeling was of the Sanhedrin was at the time of my passing was that if they killed me, then the whole movement would die off. Mm. And uh, and then after after quite a number of years, it was quite evident that not only was the movement not dying off, but actually it was growing, and that eventually became quite a concern to okay. the Roman power, the mm. Roman world power at the time, and so. And so, and it was also quite a concern to the Jews. Uh, the Jews didn't want that happening either. Mm. And so, there were quite a lot of cooperative efforts in order to find Mary um, and to kill her. And also, because it was rumoured that I'd had a child, there was these cooperative efforts to also to find my children and kill them as well. Yeah. And and your child was Sarah. Yep. And she survived. And um, she 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 was born after I, I passed. Obviously, mm. she she was born in Egypt, um, and uh, and then shortly after uh, she, uh, shortly after her birth, uh, they were forced to flee from Egypt, and they fl- 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 fled via ship to the su- south of France via via um, the the islands you know malta okay. and mm-hmm. cyprus and and through sicily and so forth into southern so Spain. there is something to this bloodline is there <laughs> uh, no because no. what happened is that uh, shortly after the time of mary's passing both luke and sarah and their three children my three grandchildren all were murdered yeah. and and nobody survived after that so what so, was the circumstance in with that well, what happened uh, was that uh, Mary, who was by this stage, uh, so we're now talking 30 years after mm-hmm. my death, Mary by this stage was teaching again. She was teaching mm-hmm. uh, quite openly in the south of France. She had quite a large following. The Roman army, the Romans heard about, heard about this and uh, they, they, found, they found her. And there was a few days warning that they were going to find her. And Mary decided to stay behind. Mary decided to just face the army rather than flee. Because she'd probably, she'd spent most of her life in hiding up to this point and and was quite tired of fleeing. She was Mm. quite, she was in her 50s by this stage. um, So she was quite tired of fleeing. But uh, Luke, the Sarah, Sarah and the three grandchildren all, um, they were all, still wanting to stay alive of course so they decided to flee so they left southern france and went to italy via by via boat unfortunately though um the roman army were also told where they were and on the boat luke and the three children were murdered um and sarah actually survived uh, to old age because they thought her eldest daughter was sarah so 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 what had happened was Luke and Sarah had three children. Mm-hmm. Their eldest was a daughter. And when the Romans killed the four of them, the Luke and the three children, they thought the oldest child was actually his wife. And so they didn't pursue Sarah anymore. And Sarah went back to the southern France eventually. She had a very hard time in her life and went back to southern France. And she actually started the movement which, which now you would call the nun movement. Um, okay, and it was very similar. She she looked after children um, for the rest of her life, taught some of the truths about divine truth until her own death, and so she died of old age. But she never remarried, and she never had more children, and that was the end of our lineage. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there is no, you know, sacred bloodline or anything like that either. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now. At the end of the Council of Nicaea, Mm -hmm. they put together the Nicene Creed, Mm -hmm. which I was asked to say when I was in my early 20s as a member of the Uniting Church as a part of my confirmation. Mm, It's interesting how long it's lasted, isn't it? (laughs) Yes, it is. And I read the Nicene Creed and I thought, well... Oh, I can't really say that <laughs> uh, because there were things that just didn't ring true for me. Um, and, and that would be the case, I feel, for many Christians, wouldn't it? If they actually knew the the full authorised teachings of mm. their own religion, many of them would disagree with those authorised teachings. Yeah. yeah. 
there. So I'm going to mention a few things, sure. which I know a lot of Christian people still um, regard as basic fundamentals of um, Christianity. Of the Christian faith. Of the Christian faith. Yeah. Um, first of all, the virgin birth. Mm-hmm. Um, many people have been criticised for doubting <laughs> that uh, your mother was a virgin. Yeah. Uh, Which I find quite amusing. He, uh, so it's, it's obviously not a. There's no truth in in the ver- So that was another attempt. No. And previous, previous people in history had been accorded the same. Had been accorded honour. Yeah. Should we call it? So this was to equate you with them. Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, yeah, my mother obviously had sex with my father Joseph, uh, just as everybody else comes into the world is the same way I came into the world. Yeah. Um, so there was there was no difference whatsoever. Okay. Mm. Now the crisp the Christmas songs talk about a perfect child. Were you a perfect child? Um, yes, I was. Um, how that happened, um, I am still not completely. Um, like obviously, it happened at the time of my birth, um, and I can explain the process of what happened, but um, but I'm still not completely aware of why God made that choice but but so, what happened at the time of my birth after the umbilical cord was separated God cleared away all of my parental emotional injuries from me that was my next question <laughs> how did that not because you're saying you say today that a lot of our parental emotions are there before we're actually born yes yeah and and we have to work through those Yep. But you didn't have to work through that. No. However, that didn't mean that I didn't have some stressful experiences through my life because of th- their law of attraction, my parents' law of attraction. In other words, their mm. soul condition affected different experiences, which meant at times I was attacked and I was uh, sometimes abused and sometimes beaten. Sometimes other things would occur to me as well. Mm. But I didn't have a personal feeling that it was my fault in any way or, or a poor sense of self-worth. So one of the things that happened from a very young age was that I had a good sense of my own worth or my own self. In fact, I had a much better sense of my own worth or self than I currently have with Mm. the injuries that I currently uh, am still carrying. So so for me to assimilate truth after that was quite easy. Um, I could see when everyone around me wasn't right, when there was an emotion that they had in play that caused them to think or feel a certain way that I didn't think or feel. And so in that regard, um, I was basically cleared of parental sin, if if you want to use that term as a biblical term, or parental emotional unloving experiences, which is the same thing. Anything out of harmony with love is, is sin. And I was cleared of that sin or that disharmony with love but that didn't stop events happening that weren't very loving towards myself still yeah. occurring in my life, which I had to allow myself to feel and deal with as they happened. But you weren't the one playing up in the family. No. Your, no. Mo- your mother was very lucky. <laughs> my, yeah, my mother was often often viewed me as a lot of sort of like the ideal son um, in the first century. And, and I suppose in a lot of way I was the ideal son. Um, Ironically, my mum now has had very similar emotions too. Um, even with the injuries that I had, she's often felt that I was the ideal son as well. But in the first century, my mother had the didn't have an awareness of why that was the case. She just thought mm. I was a good boy, yeah. basically. And everyone around basically didn't notice much difference in me, aside from the fact that I was gentle um, and a good boy, uh, as as you would term it nowadays, yeah. and I didn't. Uh, I always tried my best with everything that I did, and and I wasn't ever violent um, or angry, which mm. which was very unusual back then. Um, but it wasn't something that everyone really noticed because they were totally involved in their own life, and and as most people are now, a bit self-absorbed in their own life, and so they don't really notice. So if you were picked on as a kid, like all kids are, yep. you walked away. Yes, yeah. Um, I walked away and I also understood the emotion in the other person as to why they were picking on me. I didn't take it on as a self-blame or a Mm -hmm. self-hatred or I didn't feel like I had to defend it because I had a fairly good viewpoint of myself so I didn't feel like I had to defend the attack. Um, 
and so a lot of people around me thought that was weakness um, and during my childhood that was often played upon mm-hmm. um, they thought that because I was accepting of these particular things that they called that weak my, my own father was often quite concerned about how weak I was and he did certain mm-hmm. things to toughen me up as a result yeah <laughs> didn't call you Sue or anything <laughs> yeah. um, Okay, yeah. Jesus was God incarnate, God walking with man on earth. Um. Yeah, there is, there is some truth in that, in the sense that when you become at one with God, God is able to transmit his feelings through you to others. And so once I was in the condition of one with God, which occurred when I was in my thir- early 30s, um, once I was in that condition, people around me could feel the presence of God, if you like, mm-hmm. because because I was reflecting God's feelings and God's thoughts on every single matter. And so in that way, you could say those words, but not in the way that they're now implied. The way that mm-hmm. they're now implied was that I began as God and then I somehow disavowed myself as God and became a human and uh, and then after I passed I became God again mm. um, and while I was on earth I was a God man and those particular thoughts are distortions of that underlying truth of one with God so did you say when you see me you see the father yes definitely okay yeah there so are many you were of the saying that when say. you see me, you see attributes of the Father, not exactly. God. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and what I was implying all the time was that if you became at one with God, you would reflect God's nature in all of your dealings with others. Mm-hmm. And so therefore anyone around you would start to feel the personality or nature of God because you are at one with God and therefore you're reflecting God's personality and nature through you. And so um, I, that's why I said also the words, you must become perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Because to become at one with God, you have to become perfect. Mm. Um, and all of these teachings get distorted mm. by different language or different feelings that happen as a result of different people intellectualizing the process mm. that I was teaching as an emotional process. But, um, but initially, um, there are underlying truths in in many mm. and and many of the statements I've made, there are underlying truths in many of the statements I've made that are now being misinterpreted mm. uh, and taught as something different to what they actually are. Mm. Yeah. I, I recall one passage where someone says, "Good teacher," and the biblical account says, "Don't call me good." Exactly. Only God is good. Yeah, and I actually did say that. Okay. Yeah. And um, that always confused me as a child because I thought, well... How could I be God and not good? <laughs> yeah, that's right. If, I, if you are God, then they have the right to call you good, mm-hmm. surely. Yeah. And what I was always trying to do is to, to demonstrate the separateness of God and myself. In other words, that mm-hmm. I always said God was my father, that God, God was my source of life, God was my creator, I am his creation... And so forth. There was always I was always teaching a separation between myself and God as an identity or an entity, mm. but not a separation in terms of the feelings that were coming out of me because I was at one with God. I'd, I'd, I'd now taken on God's love to such an extent that I was now divine in the sense that all of God's qualities and nature and attributes could now be demonstrated through myself, through that connection that I had with God. Mm. So, And it's the distortion of that understanding that has resulted in a lot of Christian teachings that are now false yeah. teachings. Now, that, that's a major distortion. To If you were to be an example of what we are to become, mm-hmm. and then we elevate you to a level where you your life is unattainable exactly then that is a that is a a huge distortion which is uh that must have made you fairly sad (laughs) yeah well a person at one with god doesn't get sad but um um, i've certainly had feelings about it in this life about the Mm. distortion but the reality is that it, it has created difficulties for many Christians in their life both while they are on earth and also when they pass in mm. their spirit world 
unfortunately, all untruth does that. Every mm-hmm. time untruth is presented as truth, it does have a, an effect on the lives, and depending on how popular the life is, on the lives of millions. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, in my case, the distortions of the truth have resulted in pain for millions of people. Um, so when I look at the pain of those millions of people, obviously, you know, one of the reasons why we've returned is we want to correct that so that pain doesn't exist continually. And of course, we spend a lot of time in the spirit world trying to undo the results of that particular mm-hmm. pain that were created by the distortion of truth. But um, from a happiness perspective, I was still personally happy, if that makes sense, because yeah. I was at one with God. Yeah. Um, but, but I do see truth or the lack of it as a major creation of unhappiness and pain and suffering. Mm. And Christians historically have experienced a fair portion of pain and suffering because of some of these distortions in truth. Mm. And this whole idea that my life was unattainable as a result of me now being God incarnate um, is something that was totally the opposite of what I was attempting to teach. Mm. I was trying to teach to everyone that everyone could change. Everyone could become perfect. Everyone could could, could become what God designed them to be. Everyone could become at one with God and experience the happiness of that connection. And and yet, one of the results of the teaching eventually, or the modifications of the teaching, has been that nobody can because I was the only person who was perfect. And now Mm. Christians totally believe this. And the way you described that was to be born again, is it not? Yes. Now, Christians bandy that term around, you know, you're a born-again Christian. Yes. So what is the difference between your being born again and a born-again Christian? Well, being born again is a transition of the soul. It's like the soul turning from a caterpillar into a butterfly. It's it's that kind of miraculous transition. Mm. And it's a transition that occurs because of the reception of divine love into the soul to such an extent that you're now one with God and it's impossible for you to think feel or act out of harmony with the love of God that exists within you. So now, why is a born-again Christian not like that? Well, a born-again Christian is, they say they're born again because of the sacrifice or because of their, their faith in the blood of Jesus. And my blood does not accomplish this particular transformation. In fact, it's impossible to, to do this transformation without the reception of divine love into the human soul. And that's where I feel a lot of the mistakes are made. There's, a, there's an attribute, we're, we're attributing, or Christians are attributing being born again to belief in myself or belief in the saving grace of my blood. Mm. When the reality is it needs to be attributed to, to God's love entering the soul. And that's the transformational thing that, occur, that causes you to become born again. And it's not something that happens just overnight. It's a process that happens till you get to the point of one with God. So you can receive bits and pieces of divine love and you receive more and more. Eventually you receive so much that you've now, there's no trace of imperfection within you anymore. You are now the person God created you to be. So it's a process. It's not something that can be instant, that, that you become born again from, from some instant kind of transformation. Yeah. You could think of it as like gestation through to birth. Mm. Um, there is a process of change yep. that must occur, and and I illustrated that through many of my illustrations. You know, the old wine skin, new wine skin illustration, um, that the soul had to change to mm. receive divine love. You know, that's what that illustration was all about. Mm. Um, the illustration about the building on the rock mass compared to building on the sand. That mm. illustration was again all about this transformation. If the the sand was your own love, building on your own love, mm. trying to change your own love, trying to do what you what was what you felt was right, building on the rock mass. The rock mass was God's love entering the soul, creates stability. You now have a firmness in you for truth and love, and eventually when you become at one with God, it's so stable nothing can shake it. And these illustrations were illustrations that I gave that are now misunderstood, but they were mm. illustrations that I gave all trying to illustrate the point of the difference between developing natural love and developing by receiving God's love. But a a born-again Christian can still pray to God with a sincerity Mm -hmm. and and you say they can still receive divine love even though they may have a misinterpretation of the doctrine. Every single person on the planet of any religious background, whether they be Christian or any other religion, 
can receive divine love from God because God is not dependent upon religious denomination. God is also not dependent upon intellectual belief. So it doesn't really matter what our intellectual belief is as to whether we receive divine love. What matters more is what our emotions are feeling with God. So when I have a longing towards God to receive love, God will give me that love as long as there is no emotional impediment within me to receiving it. Mm. And, and any person of any faith can do that, including a born-again Christian. Um, some born-again Christians have received a lot of divine love as a result of their desire for God's love and God's, as they may call it, grace. Um, and as a result of that, they've received a lot of divine love. Unfortunately, what happens eventually, though, truth catches up with us, or a lack of truth catches up with us, where we believe we have received it because of certain things, and that false belief prevents us from receiving more until we release that belief. And so with every single religious format on earth, until they bring themselves into harmony with God's truths, not their own, not man's created truths, but God's truths, they're not going to be able to become at one with God. They can receive divine love, mm. but not to the point of at one moment. To become at one with God, you have to have God's truth in mm. you. And that's very different than having man's truth in you or, or, mm. or some kind of denominational truth in you. Yeah. Uh, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the mm -hmm. Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, I've never quite understood and most this, Christians say are a mystery. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this transaction mm -hmm. that needed to occur for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. Again, there is some truth in some of these things, uh, and then it got distorted through this process uh, that we were talking about prior. The what it, what the actual truth is that there is God, the Creator of the universe, and the Creator of love, and God has her own love to give all of her creations. Then there is myself, God's the first person who ever received God's love to the point of atonement with God on this planet. So there's God and Jesus. We are separate entities, and in fact, I will never ever become God. I can become like God because I'm receiving divine love from God to the point of atonement with God, and, and even further than that, you can receive more and more divine love constantly through this this relationship with God, and you get to the point where because you're at one with God uh, and and have that God's thoughts on all matters, you're obviously in that place very, very clear about truth and what, mm -hmm. what is true and what is not true. So that, that's a beautiful place to be in. But, that, but, but that's me still a man in this transformed place. So the man has now become the grub, if you like. The man has now become the butterfly or the divine angel mm -hmm. through this process. That's still a separate entity to God. Yep. So there is no God the Son, God the Father. There is just God the Father. There is no God the Son. There is a Son who has become divine being through this process of receiving divine love. And the process via which he received divine love was through the connection with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is like a spirit, the spirit of truth. In other words, while I am in a state of truth in comparison to God's truth, so it has to be God's truth, not man's truth, while I'm in a state of truth, I can receive love. When I'm out of harmony with truth, the, the connection between myself and God is broken. And the Holy Spirit is the connection, the physical connection that connects us with God if we're in a state of truth. Okay. And uh, that, so it's not an entity, it's a force, uh, or you could even more accurately say it's a conduit for the force of love. So, and that's why, and the reason why I called it the Holy Spirit mm. was because anything to do with love is the most holy possible thing that you could consider. Mm. There are other spirits of God. There's a creative spirit of God. There's a wisdom, which is also a spirit of God, and so forth. But they are nothing in comparison to this Holy Spirit, which is the conduit of divine love the, the the only way in which a human soul can grow yeah. is, is by connecting to that conduit now most christians say that jesus died for our sins it's mm -hmm. the first thing that uh, someone who is knocking at your door will tell you and yet my grandfather who was a minister mm -hmm. of religion um, and quite a smart one mm -hmm. he told me that 
there is actually no reference in any of the Gospels as to you mentioning or connecting your death with the forgiveness of sins. Exactly. In so fact, you, you never did it. You never did it, and it's not even in the Bible. That's correct. So why do we think that you died for our sins? Well, this is a, um, an emotion in mankind. They always want to make somebody else responsible for their badness. We always want to have somebody else be blamed for what I did wrong. Um, and you see this happening all the time in mankind. So, so the ultimate of that is to get one man being responsible for all of the wrongs of all humanity. And it's just that a scapegoat, a scapegoat uh, taken to that extension. Now, the reality is that it doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever. Firstly, my blood is a physical force, nothing to do with the spiritual matter. So how can blood actually save anybody? My blood now, if you look at the body that I had blood in 2,000 years ago, is now in trees, plants and ground all through the Middle East most probably. <laughs> and, uh, and yet it has no, had no effect on clearing away the sins of mm -hmm. most of the people involved who even put faith in it. Mm -hmm. In the sense that almost everyone who say they have faith in my blood as a saving, the saving force themselves continues to sin. Which is proof in itself that my blood does nothing. If my blood did something, they would all no longer sin. So it makes no logical sense. And it also is not what I taught. Mm. I, in fact, I said that the, and if you think about it, all of the gospel accounts refer to me teaching the truth about God's love entering the soul to this transformational point, which is the born again point. And I taught that before I died. I didn't say it was dependent upon my death. Mm. I said it was dependent upon listening to my words, mm. which is very, very different. And, uh, and this is, I feel, something that's a major distortion, again, yeah. of the truth. And unfortunately, it causes people to feel that they don't have to have any personal effort involved in the process of uniting with God. Mm -hmm. And that is a gross untruth. Mm. And unfortunately, causes a lot of people to stagnate in their spiritual development. Mm. Now, I, I quoted this to... Uh, a friend of mine mm -hmm. in about 30 years ago that there was no that you never actually connected your death to the forgiveness of sins he believed it and he went away and he searched his bible and he came back and he said uh, here we go uh, it says here john the baptist behold the son of man who has come to take away the sins of the earth mm -hmm. which is exactly why i came <laughs> so so but, but it didn't say that my blood did it no. It said, "It said, behold, the Son of Man has come away to take away, come to take away the sins of the earth, which is exactly a truth. Mm -hmm. The whole reason why I feel God began that process with me in the first century, and then I embraced it because I had to actually take action to embrace the process of becoming at one with God, was so that everyone on earth was shown by God how to become at one with God and therefore become sinless. Therefore." take away the sins of the earth yeah. so so the reality is my life did demonstrate how to become at one with god and therefore how to take away your sin mm -hmm. but it was just not through my death or my blood or mm -hmm. my flesh dying that caused that transition yeah mm -hmm. now i've heard you uh, describe the uh, in more modern contemporary terms the mm -hmm. word sin yeah can you describe that again sin is anything that is disharmonious with god's love so okay yeah so not just I've human heard you love. say error yeah it is error anything that's disharmonious with god's love is error or untruth mm -hmm. and therefore it is sin and while i and unfortunately sin enters us emotionally in other words we believe it and then it becomes a part of our life and we actually feel it to be true. So, for example, it's a sin for you to believe that you're not the best of God's creation. In other words, the reason why it's a sin is because God, from God's perspective, sees you as the pinnacle of, God, of her creation. And if God sees you as that and you don't see yourself as that, as, as that, then you are now sinning. You have now disagreed with God and you are now in error and you are now sinning. There's no punishment necessarily associated with it, with the exception that while you believe you are not the pinnacle of God's creation, you're probably going to act like you're not the pinnacle of God's creation, which has its own consequences. 
but uh, but there is no punishment from God directly for you to mm. take those beliefs because God gave you the will, the free will, to make the choice to believe that if that's what you wished. Mm. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to move on now to memories. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, your birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you've stated that you were, in fact, the Messiah, as foretold in the Old Testament. Judaism believed that the Messiah would be a descendant of David, would observe Jewish law, mm -hmm. and be a great military leader. Mm -hmm. Were you any of these, and if not, why not? Well, I was a descendant of David. My family uh, was did descend from from David and uh, to and Joseph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's an My interesting father. interesting point because I've heard people say, "Well, then Mary Mary was a virgin, so that connection sort of disappears." <laughs> you know, if yeah. Joseph had nothing to do with it, why trace everything back to Joseph? Exactly. And then he had nothing to do with it. Yeah. So you were a descendant of David. The reality, though, in the first century is that generally you didn't know who your father was. There was no, you know, test, a genetic test to mm -hmm. link you with your father. It was only presumed based on your mother's word. So, so the reality is the only way a genetic line could actually be traced, given the technology at the time, was through the mother. And my mother was also a descendant of David. Oh, OK. So... so. so so both my father and mother were from the tribe of Judah and their and descendants of David. So, um, but but, unfortunately, but you weren't a great military leader. Well, my father expected me to be, um, and, and so he said so did. Um, and so uh, did many of my disciples. Many of the disciples, yeah. Um, and in fact, it was one of the reasons why, uh, that one of the things that caused my death was some of the beliefs of some of my disciples that I would become this great military leader. To lead them away from the oppression of Rome mm. and the oppression of the Jewish religious leaders as well, mm. and um, there was a lot of radicalness at the time in the first century. You know, before I remember as a child seeing quite a number of uh, of what you would now call terrorists hung on crosses, or on the side of the streets that you would walk down, um, who had opposed either the Roman Empire or the Jewish Sanhedrin in some way, and. Um, so, so it was a time of radical behaviour generally because people were tired of the oppression. And, uh, but that, they then expected me to be the, the relief from the oppressor. And I, I taught that relief from the oppressor only came through love, by loving the oppressor. Mm. And, uh, and then the oppressor would see they had nothing to fear and therefore would highly unlikely ever attack you as a result. Um, but hardly any of my disciples understood that but by the time of my death. Mary understood it, but very few others. Uh, John did understand it quite well. But others like Peter and Judas and, and many of the other of the so-called Twelve, which was another discussion, um, they <laughs> did not understand you know, that principle at all. And, uh, and you know, Judas himself wanted to cause a... Um, confrontation, confrontation yeah, mm -hmm. between myself and the religious leaders and the Rome, Romans, uh, which was the primary reason why. So that you could reveal your power as a military. Yes, yes. He, he felt uh, many of my disciples had a, quite a condescending viewpoint towards myself in that they felt that they knew better than I did as to how I should proceed with my ministry. And quite often they tried to force me down a path uh, which often had unexpected results for them. Mm. And it was quite frequent, uh, different things that they would organise. But surely by that point you would have taught pacifism. Certainly, certainly. So Which they disagreed with. They disagreed with it. Yeah, uh, they okay. thought that was just one of my Weaknesses. failings. Yeah, mm. yeah. They, they felt I had a few failings. They thought that Mary was one of my failings. <laughs> they believed that uh, my soulmate, uh, because of a history and background, was one of my weaknesses and, and they also believed that my pacifism was a weakness. They believed that my, um, um, my statements of truth and use of illustrations was a bit of a weakness. They often could the not parables. understand them. They could not understand my parables. Mm. Um, and quite often I had long discussions with them after talking about a parable about <laughs> what the parable actually meant mm. to them in their own lives. And they also had a lot of difficulty with prayer. They, they had a lot of difficulty connecting with God. They didn't understand the connection with God. There were a few that did, 
mm. and many of the women did, uh, but very few of the men. And um, you know, only a very few of the men did really understand what it meant to ever become at one with God and prayer. That prayer was the longing, the feeling of longing for God mm. and longing for God's love. Yeah. yeah, what are the circumstances of your birth? It's not the Chris, the Christmas story. Um, <laughs> I've heard you go into a, a fair bit of detail. Yeah. Probably, um, you don't have to go into so much detail. Well, you've got to remember that the circumstances of my birth have been told to me because at that stage you don't have a development no. intellect to actually remember the event. So I can only recount to you what my mother and father have told me. Um, the circumstances about my birth were we were living in Nazareth at the time, at the time and then what happened was that uh, Joseph, uh, my father, and Mary um, decided to travel to Joseph's, my father's father's land, which was down near Bethlehem. And um, this was done for a variety of reasons, but the primary reason was my mother's worry. My mother was worried because just around about the time period of that time in Nazareth, there was quite a lot of what you would call terror, terrorism or acts of violence, random acts of violence caused by people who were against Roman oppression, but they were also unfortunately themselves oppressing the common people. And in Nazareth, we had had a number of these events just before, while well, my mother was pregnant, just before my birth. And my mother wanted to go somewhere safer and somewhere safer was closer to the Roman garrison, uh, which happened to be in Jerusalem. Okay. So, so, so my father and my mother decided to travel to Bethlehem. And as it turned out, we, we rocked up there at night, um, just, just on dusk. And my father, well, back then, uh, hospitality was never presumed upon. It was a terrible thing to presume upon it, even if it was offered to you. You mm. wouldn't presume that you should say yes to it. And so my father's family, um, one of his brothers, um, offered for us to stay in the home that he had, uh, which would have meant moving some of the children out of one room and so forth, you know, quite a lot of trouble. And so my father, feeling bad that he'd rocked up, in, you know, near evening, um, decided, no, that would not be suitable under any circumstance. So we finished up staying in what the Bible now calls the manger or the or what you would now in Australia call just a just a, the barn. The barn. Mm. A, a, a shed, you know, okay. where the cattle were kept or where the sheep were kept. Um usually by this stage the sheep were kept close by um because it, it was nearing it was nearing winter time and uh, and so therefore and in winter in Jerusalem can get quite bitter, uh, and in Bethlehem the same. Um, so, so what we would, what they would generally do is they'd keep the animals in at night and let them out during the day and put them back in at night and so forth. And it was the last of that time. It was like just the transition between spring, uh, sort of between autumn and winter. And so, you know, they were kept outdoors uh, generally. Sometimes overnight, the shepherds would stay outdoors. But short, shortly near Christmas time, or near what you call Christmas time now, they would bring them indoors. Now, I wasn't born on Christmas Day. Um, I, December the 25th happens to be, um, at, the, at the time, the shortest day of the year. So it, December the 25th was chosen because it was the time that the Romans worshipped the sun god. It was mm -hmm. the shortest day, and so what they would do is have a big celebration about the lengthening of the days now, mm -hmm. working towards yep. uh, spring and then summer uh, from winter. Mm -hmm. And so what they did, they decided to do as a part of the amalgamation of teachings, was to put my birth date on December the 25th. So I was not born on December the 25th. But you think it was, you, you don't really have an idea. You think well, I was born in the month of Tishrei, which, which, was, which, which is more like September, October. Our time there, and um, I died in the month, uh, month of Nisan, which is like anywhere between March and April. Our time now, remembering of course that we had twenty, we had lunar calendar, mm -hmm. so um, not not a solar calendar, and every fiftieth year we'd have a jubilee to catch up with the solar calendar, and um, this was the way of the Jews. So 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 to calculate it accurately in terms of my birthday is quite a complex mathematical calculation going mm -hmm. back two thousand years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, now your early childhood, do you have any early childhood memories like 
you know, say up to the age of 10 or... Yeah, lots of early childhood memories. Um, you know, I can remember as a very young child, just a few years of age, uh, playing on the side, side of the river. Um, we lived... Uh, well, I suppose I should mention that... So you were near a river? Yeah, we, we, we moved to Egypt. Uh, that is an accurate uh, thing that happened from our birth. So, so from my birth... Um, the, you know, the events of the Bible portrays in my birth, some are accurate but mistimed and others are a bit inaccurate um, and embellished is the best way to put it. So, so I did have three magi or three uh, astrologers, you would now probably call mm-hmm. them, from, from the east to come to visit me um, when I was around two and a bit months old, nearly three months old. And um, they, they did offer some gifts nothing of substantial value as the bible would seem to imply at this point but but uh, you know there was a little trinkets i suppose you mm-hmm. recall them they came but they also came with the warning that because they had actually visited herod before they visited my father and they said to herod that we're looking for the messiah the king of the jews and herod of course um had a major issue with that he 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 was he was a despot uh, and violently so, he he had no compunction to kill all of the members of his family in order to stay presiding as the ruler. And in fact, he, he, uh, his his whole desire was to have his entire family murdered at the time of his death, so mm. so that so that none of them could fight with each other to determine to become another Herod. It's one way. Um, so he, he was quite a violent man and he didn't really care. He was very concerned about the Messianic prophecies. It, in fact, it, it was an obsession of his uh, that he was concerned about them. And uh, when these priests, these astrologers came to him, um, he obviously was very concerned. And so he tried to find out where they went to find myself and my father and my mother. And uh, they warned my father about Herod's interest and my father then also had quite a lot of feelings from the spirit world about our safety, which meant he decided that when I was around four or five, four, about four months of age, he decided to move to Egypt. And we went there on foot. Okay. Yeah. And so remember, we still got the house in Nazareth, um, which we hadn't visited all that time. And so we went to uh, Egypt. And we lived in in the Delta in Egypt, uh, on the Nile Delta, uh, as did millions of other Jews actually at the time. Mm-hmm. And there was a synagogue there. It was quite a lot. There was over a million other Jews in the city nearby us. And my father practiced his artisanship, uh, which was like a builder nowadays, um, and became quite wealthy through that process. Um, but my father did some things with me. He uh, so I can remember playing as a young boy on the sides of the river, being fascinated in creation, being having having my father quite confused about my nature, because he at this stage felt I was the Messiah. Um, but he thought I'd be some, uh, you know, wanted warrior. You know, mm. he, he was trying to teach me to become a warrior, and I was very gentle. And the more he tried to teach me to become a warrior, the more gentle I became, um, which often infuriated him. And uh, and so he decided to educate me, which was something that he possibly would not have done if I, if he didn't feel I was a messiah. So I went to uh, school um, from quite from a quite a young age uh, in the first century. Were you a bright kid? Yeah, I was just like pretty much as I am now, I suppose. Uh, so caught on pretty quickly with mm-hmm. everything. Um, mm-hmm. I learnt to speak. Uh, a few different languages in the process and um, I also was fascinated with the what you would call the prophetic books of the Old Testament which were scrolls in our, in our time and from, so from what age oh from the age of five yeah so I was fascinated I loved it so mm. I loved study uh, you know you didn't have to force me to go to school mm. like I'd be gone before mum and dad knew <laughs> pretty much and uh, we had usually three hours in the morning yeah. of it. And, uh, and so what, what I did was I spent a lot of time talking to the, the, the synagogue 
the person who ran the synagogue and uh, and with the other school students which were all more they were all more wealthy than my family mm. but uh, um, so I finished up rubbing shoulders with wealthier children for a period of time yeah now Luke mentions <laughs> Luke's the only gospel that mentions John the Baptist as a relative uh, you've said that he is a cousin of yours and that mm. you were six months apart mm. uh, was he one of your childhood friends or... no because I never met him until I was 12 um, oh, okay so um, I, I didn't have that many friends when I was in Egypt because everyone thought I was too gentle by nature. They sort of, I was a bit ridiculed because of being quite gentle. My father got quite concerned. And so when I was seven years of age, he put me in a school with some Roman, some, what you would call now mercenaries, who had, ran a school to help people become military, like to train people in the military arts. So I was trained how to use a sword and I was trained how to use all these different things, how to fight and so forth. And I, I was quite resistive to the process. And on top of that, uh, they had women there that the, that the, the, the um, school leaders would, would use as prostitutes, basically. And they often had daughters, which they, also, they usually incorporated the sons into the army but any daughters those women had they would they would use them as prostitutes as well to train the children who were learning the military arts how to rape and pillage basically mm. um and how did you react to all that yeah no I, I was really distressed about it um and in fact uh um there was there was a i befriended one of the younger girls who was being raped pretty regularly um and you know in terms of just trying to help her to to either break away from the whole environment and leave or but but i never was successful it's one of the feelings I, I felt disappointed about um i remember having you know having quite a few number of cries about that and eventually i got mm. quite upset about it and i refused to go which my father was quite angry about because mm. he, he just saw it as another failure of me becoming the messiah mm. Now you had to move at about ten or eleven. Yeah, we moved by sea. By this stage, I had uh, you know, two sisters and five brothers. So, so uh, you know, there were there were basically eight children and mum and dad. So ten of us, and it was a bit hard to move us all by land. So my father sold up everything that he had there, and converted it all into money at the time. You know, the gold at the time, and uh, we took a ship. Um, from Alexandria to Joppa, and um, and then came in via, from the coast to Nazareth. Okay, and so now we're into your teenage years. Yeah, and that's when I first met John, John the Baptist, my cousin. Okay. Yeah, and we were fast friends from the moment we met. You've described um, him as being mediumistic, like yourself. Yes. What do you mean by that? Well, he talked to spirits like I did uh, when I was young, and he um, he had. He he also was deeply spiritual, um, because his father was a a priest um, and quite aged. He sort of had this same kind of background as me in a lot of ways, where he 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 wasn't into the military arts so much. He was more gentle, although sometimes his nature wasn't that gentle when he got speaking. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was more gentle. He promoted natural love. He he was deeply connected with natural love. And we had some common spirit friends, um, which meant that we spent a lot of our time together investigating things spiritually, um, you know, through conversations with our spirit friends and through different investigations we used to do with our spirit friends and so forth while we were t together. So any time I saw him, we, we lived quite separate to, it, to each other, like uh, yeah, quite, quite a long distance, 200 kilometres or so away from each other. But we got to see each other usually twice a year, generally. Okay. And, and usually for a month to two months at a time because my father would travel down to Jerusalem. My father at this stage was very keen on becoming a member of the Sanhedrin. Um, he, he was a Pharisee um, and he was very keen on uh, his Pharisaical life. Um, and he also saw it as a responsibility to bring me up as the Messiah, to be a Pharisee. 
and so he attempted to inculcate most of the Pharisaic teachings to myself and and as a result of that we went down to Jerusalem quite regularly comp considering how difficult it was to go and because my father by this stage had quite a thriving business we had about 30, 30 employees and he could afford to go for months at a time and he had a good foreman um, and he could afford to go for a month or a couple of months at a time and eventually my father bought a house in Jerusalem uh, that we could frequent between the two places um, so J John the Baptist being close by you know a couple mm -hmm. of kilometers from Jerusalem um, yeah we got to spend lots of time together during those you know four months of the year and he had some sort of vibe that uh, you were destined for something well the spirits with him were were telling him the same things that they were telling me of course but but um, but that was a bit later when we spent time apart. They would talk to him about my role, what would be my future role, and so mm. forth. And so he, you know, he would relate those things back to me sometimes, or to other people. And when he started his ministry, he he um, used to relate those things quite frequently. So, how old were you when you had this realization that, uh, or? definite realization that you were the messiah and that you had a role to play or well my father had always told me that i was the messiah and and i didn't believe him um, my readings of the prophecies were all about love every time i read them i could see that god was trying to teach humankind about love about softening their heart not hardening their heart not being violent being gentle having having morality you know having a connection with mm. the truth and and some of the prophetic books really interested me the book of hosea really interested me um, because it illustrates the forgiveness process um, and you know these kind of principles are i so i read into the prophetic books a lot different sort of things than what the average priest or synagogue leader would actually read into them and so I saw it almost I started to see everything as a love based thing so by the time I was 14 or 15 I realized that the Messiah was coming and I had a very strong feeling that Messiah was coming and um, the prophetic books of Daniel pointed to the time period I was living in as a time period of the Messiah and so I then started looking for the Messiah <laughs> I didn't assume it was myself. I started looking for the Messiah, you know, in others. So, when any religious leader would pop up who seemed to gather a following, I would investigate their teachings and so forth, and 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 see, you know, whether they knew about love, which mm -hmm. was what I felt was the mark of the Messiah. And sooner or later, it became very clear that they didn't know about love. And so, you know, I'd give up the search for that particular person and see until another person came along. And I continued doing that until I was around 19 years of age. And then you went, uh-oh. Yeah, when I was around 19 years of age, I started having very emotional experiences about the potentiality of myself being the Messiah. And by the time I was about 21, that had solidified quite strongly in my, in my heart because nobody else seemed to know about love and I seemed to understand love and nobody else seemed to understand it along with a lot of other things that I seem to have understood that nobody else understood including spirits and the spirit world and the condition of the earth and the moral condition the emotional condition of humanity uh, truth the the importance of truth in terms of your day-to-day -day interactions all of these principles that I was very firm on by now um, they were all pretty solid in me by that stage and so I started having to contemplate that I was potentially the Messiah, which still, when I think about, makes me feel quite emotional, because um, it was a very emotional experience, mm. um, and it's still quite an emotional experience when I think about that. Yeah. Um, so there were during this time there were a lot of events, of course, that occurred. My father, when I was fifteen, for example, my father would say you know, to other people in Nazareth, you know, my son's the Messiah. By this stage, he didn't really know whether it was true or not. He, he, he was quite confused because he could see that I wasn't... Uh, he, living up to his expectations. Yeah, definitely not living up to his expectations at all. 
so he was quite confused and he was quite upset um, that I wasn't living up to his expectations but um, he would tell everybody still the same thing now of course quite a lot of other people would get quite angry and upset about all that and they'd laugh at him about that and laugh at me because I was so gentle and and so much of a pacifist and I didn't know how to fight you know and any time I got in a fight I was always just let myself be beaten up and when I was 15 um, a group of young boys in our teenagers in our town stripped me naked and beat me beat me up fairly badly and uh, my father was enraged after that he, he was really really upset with my pacifist nature after that and um, and then when I was around in my early 20s I was by this stage quite tall like I was around I, I grew to be around six foot tall and I was quite good with my hands with the with the because uh, I was a part of dad's business by from the age of 12 onwards and so you know I, was, I became a carpenter as the legend says and and um, it presumes doesn't it? it doesn't really say no it doesn't really say and my father wanted me to actually run the business that was his underlying desire for me which which being the eldest son being the eldest son and uh, and that wasn't my desire which caused additional friction between mm. myself and my father and then um, a, a local lady a local girl young girl um, who had four brothers and a father um, showed some interest in me which which I knew she wasn't my soulmate so I repelled it and my father was quite upset with it because he felt that that was a good family and so forth. And the girl herself became quite upset as well. Um, she um, she felt what was, herself. What was her name? I can't remember her name. <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's Isabella, but I can't remember exactly her name now. Um, but what happened was. Um, she told her father that that I had slept with her, and and told her father that I had then rejected her after sleeping with her. Now, back then, of course, if you slept with somebody, you were definitely going to marry them, mm. and uh, and if you reject them, then you basically had the entire family on your back, and the entire family uh, grabbed me, um, and almost tortured me to death. They broke my back, broke both my legs, um, allowed their dogs to eat up part of my face. They pinned me to the ground and, and burnt, burnt me. Um, and that was when I was 21. Did and you have scarring? From that? Yeah, yeah, terrible scarring. I was, I was um, for, for three months I couldn't walk at all. And I was just, just laid in bed. Uh, she she heard the only thing that saved me was that she heard that they had decided to um to do this to me and she ran into the they did it in the town square um and uh to make a you know example of me basically to any other young male who may consider doing the same to their daughter um but what finished up happening was that um, she heard about it and she told them the truth and that was the only thing that got them to stop um, otherwise I probably would have died so I was left um, I couldn't walk and I had broken pelvis um, broken legs um, they broke both of my arms as well um, pinned to the ground with, with a spear is the way they used to do it they used to put a spear through you and then burn the edges of it so that it wouldn't bleed and so you'd stay alive a long time um, and then they could torture you for longer that that was their goal and um, you know they, how old were you then I was 21 21 yeah so after that um, the girl saw what they had done and obviously I wasn't the beautiful looking man that she <laughs> loved before then but uh, she hung herself in my room actually as well so that happened shortly afterwards so um, once I could walk my father and the family were still pretty upset with me because I hadn't married their daughter and now their daughter had suicided um, 
And my father, by this stage, was quite upset with me about a lot of issues. He couldn't. He thought that I deserved what had happened to me. Um, so, so I realised I had to leave home, really. And so I left home, and I lived in a cave for four years. Yep. And a the 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 leader of the synagogue in Nazareth lo- loved me, and he would bring me food. Um, my mother would see me occasionally, um, but my father wouldn't see me at all. And I was sort of a recluse. And during that time, I pray- just prayed a lot and received a lot of love, and my body healed very rapidly as a result. So after nearly five years, my body had gotten back to exactly the same as before. Otherwise, I would have had made, been a cripple all of my mm. life. Yeah. What, what is this um, sect called the Essenes? And is that... Well, I'd heard of them. They were another one of the people that I'd heard and investigated in the first century. But I could see that they had a lot of unloving teachings as well. So... Um, so you know, I, I could see the Messiah couldn't come from the Essenes. So you weren't influenced by any of the. Um, it's funny. You could say, you could say that I was influenced by everything or or nothing. Um, mm. Everything in the sense that I used to investigate everything, mm. and nothing in the sense that if it was it was only if it was in harmony with love or truth that I would accept it. So. So that's how I would investigate everything. And they were on Mount Carmel, is that correct? Or? They had a lot of different places around. Eventually they they went to Mount Carmel, um, but, but they had many other places around generally. It was only when they started to get oppressed that they, that they sort of gathered together in communities. Um, they were like any other sect, or well, what you would call a sect today, you know, that if the sect is oppressed, then generally they finish up gathering together in a community and and therefore having closer association with each other. But generally, if they're not oppressed, they'll be throughout society. They had a lot of interesting belief systems. John the Baptist was also quite interested in them at times. But um, but they also had some unloving teachings as well. Mm. That, so so that I could not agree with. Now you would have started in your twenties to. Um start to have problems with your own religion oh much earlier than that um yeah i you know i remember when i first went to jerusalem i was in my 13th year and um it it disgusted me basically um it disgusted me i became a vegetarian that year because there were just blood running down the street from the sacrifices and the sacrifices were primarily to feed the priesthood who most of whom were quite fat um, because they were living in the lap of luxury off of meat-based dishes mm. while many of the people they were serving, um, while they might not have starved, they were close to starving, some of them. And there was a spiritual drain on the people. Um, the priesthood was living in luxury while while the people they were meant to have been serving were were living in poverty. And and more was being demanded of them every time, and they set up the temple tax and a number of other other taxes, which were specifically for the Sanhedrin or members of the Sanhedrin. Generally, it was the Sadducees at the time. My father was also quite distressed with them. So they they had these animals in that that they would sort of sell as sacrificial animals. Yeah, what they would do is they'd breed up animals, which were often just the same as any other animal. There was no specific fantastic feature about the animal, but so they it didn't have it. to be a goat because I it, it yeah no there were goat and goats and sheep and sheep and so forth. But what they would do is they'd breed up from any flock, you know, they'd mm. breed up these animals, and then they'd sell them for ten times the price of a normal animal because it was one that you had to sacrifice in the temple. So and they actually sacrificed them in the temple. Yeah, and then the person who ate them wasn't the person who bought the animal; it and, was the priest. What, what was that supposed to do for them? was meant to save them from their sins. It was the same okay. principle okay. Mm-hmm. attributed eventually to myself mm-hmm. through what people believed to be Paul's thoughts, which Paul didn't have, but, yeah. Okay. So now we come to about 31. Well, there's a fair bit in between so far. Um, mm. 
you know, obviously there's another seven year, uh, nine year gap. Oh, tell um, us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the first five, I spent a lot of that time alone. So praying, getting to know God better, getting to know God's truth, experimenting with God's truths, noticing my body changing as I receive more love, uh, uh, noticing my scars healing. And I began to understand that actually love would heal as well during that time. That, that that once you receive God's love to the point of atonement, that I realised that you could actually heal, physically heal people, uh, if they were open to the healing. I, I, I learned a lot about the laws of free will, desire. Could you do laws. that in your twenties? No, not to other people. Um, no, but but my own body changing caused me to see that that was possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was around 26 or so, I decided to move to Capernaum, which was on the Sea of Galilee. And, and I had a little, what you would call a little flat run room there, um, that uh, I used to work with the fishermen mending their nets. I hated fishing, but I <laughs> mended their nets because it Did gave... Did you eat fish? You said you were no, vegetarian. No, I was vegetarian. But, um, but you, you, you didn't eat fish? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Even though you were, you were helping them fish? Well, what it did was it gave me it gave me an opportunity to talk to them, mm. which I love doing. It gave me an opportunity to talk about all these different things that I'd discovered in my early twenties while I was living alone. All these truths of God that I felt a strong desire to share with others, and that's how I met ones like John, James, Peter. You know, they they were all fishermen who either their fathers or they themselves had boats and mm. they would fish on the sea. And so um, I met them and, and, you know, eventually had a friendship with them. And, you know, they would often laugh at me and say it was sort of funny and what I was teaching and so forth. But they'd often be fascinated too, just like most people are when you talk about soul-based things. So, um, and it was great for me. It gave me a lot of opportunity to live by myself and enjoy my life. And, uh, and as a result... Um, I didn't have very high needs, and so I ended up with a, a little savings, if you like, which enabled me then to travel a little when I wanted to. Um, but Capernaum was my base until I was 30, mm. in my 30s. And no major events in that time period? Well, I suppose it depends on what you call major. Um, there's no major traumatic events that happened mm. to me during that time. Um, by this stage, my... Um, I developed another uh, another friendship with the local synagogue uh, attendant there, and um, so I spent a lot of time in the in the synagogue and um, just again reading the books. That's were the only places where the prophecies were available. I found that every time I read the prophecies, I had this tingling sensation coming through me. I could feel connected with God. I could feel God telling me things, and so I was very drawn to doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And I only worked enough to provide for myself and and spent the rest of the time doing these other things yeah it was a really important time for me though because it, it it solidified all of the teachings um, mm. that I'd been learning when I was by myself and um, it also really closely established my connection with God to the point where I became at one, one with God and I became at one with God in Capernaum at the age of 31 or in my 31st year and you never had a relationship up until this stage no no. 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 So then you started, you decided to start teaching. Yes, well, I first thing I did was I went down to John because I had a plan. And the plan was that if John went ahead of me talking about natural love, uh, then he could open up people's hearts to divine love by talking about natural love. And then I could come along afterwards and we, I could talk about the divine love, you know, and people would understand it because they've already been taught about natural love. And by this stage, John had, uh, you know, he was living in a cave down in down in the south and uh, on the river, and um, he he would uh, he would often have large people, numbers of people come, you know, thousands sometimes come and listen to him. He was quite a good orator, mm. um, and he he also was quite outspoken, so people loved it. Um, if you can imagine a very outspoken, charismatic, uh, radical, gentle person all in one. <laughs> that was pretty much John. Uh, and he was a Nazarite as well. He'd, he'd, uh, he'd decided to grow his hair long and, 
um, not cut his beard and uh, he, he wouldn't eat meat. He was basically a vegetarian as well, and yeah, so he wouldn't he wouldn't drink, and um, yeah, so. Um, you say a Nazarite. What, what do you mean? Well, a Nazarite was a person who had a a feeling to become closer to God, who would then sort of dedicate their life to God. And what they would do is they'd live basically in poverty, um, n- not eating meat because that was a sign. Eating meat was a sign of prosperity. So they they would eat. So you didn't become a, ve- a vegetarian because of any other reason, any moral reason other than okay. eating meat would have been a sign of prosperity. Um, and he, um, but he also found that when he didn't eat meat, he was closer to the spirits who he was channeling. And quite often Elijah or Elijah would come and speak through him. So that's why he was such an excellent. He was listened to frequently, mm. and many people started to feel he was Elijah or Elisha come back again. Mm. Uh, because often he would be channeling those men. Um, yeah. Was that a belief in reincarnation at the time? No, um, there were. It was a sort of. It, it was sort of like coming back. wasn't There wasn't really any firm awareness of how that might have occurred. Okay. Um, I suppose you would call it a, a flow over from some of the Hindu teachings. Um, and Buddhist teachings, um, but which which by that stage hadn't been firmly designed either. Um, mm. There was just this loose idea that used to have of when a person died and breathed out their air, that that was their last breath. And because people could feel the spirit of the person leave, they believed they had to go somewhere. And they believed that most of them believed that it just entered another child, you know, just being born. And then that's how they believed you some of some of them not not the jews themselves but some others believed reincarnation what mm. you would call reincarnation now reincarnation as it is taught now um has been a very slowly developing uh mm. idea over thousands of years yeah. Mm. Yeah. now when you reached at one with god mm-hmm. Was this a? This is when you got baptized by John. Well, I actually reached at one moment with God when I was in Capernaum, but but I decided to travel down to John and to actually be baptized so in the Jordan. What was the signal that you got? That you 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 now I'm here now. You know I've reached this level. What what gave you that idea? Well, you know when you're at one with God, um, you no longer have any uh, unhappy thought or feeling inside of yourself you can feel a permanent connection with god you can feel god's energy if you like or love going coming through you with everything that you do um you, it's a it's a it's a major transition which you definitely know as a truth has occurred it's not something that's obscure or mm. you know, it's not it's a very definite transition that occurs inside of the human soul and, and you say this also gave you knowledge as well. Additional knowledge to what I'd already developed, yeah, mm-hmm. certainly. Because now you're at one with God, all of God's knowledge on any subject can flow to you as long as you ask or have a desire to receive it. So it depends on your will. But I started receiving lots and lots of knowledge about all sorts of things. And um, I, I could understand how everything worked. So were you, when you first started teaching, was your audience, were your audiences small? Um, well, what happened was John decided, we got together, John and I, after my baptism, what you call my baptism, John and I got together and we decided that if he went ahead of me and talked about natural love and getting people to repent, you know, to, to turn around from their sins or turn, you turn towards God, and then I went after him and I talked about the principles, you know, the laws of love, divine love, that it would make it easier to actually teach the truth to others. And so... And so basically, John's audiences often turned up at my gatherings um, because of John, at John's urging. Mm. Um, and he would say things like, one, his coming, who is coming after me, you know, he, he will tell you these things that I do not know and things like that. So, you know, he would indicate 
that there was somebody because there was a lot of things that I tried to explain to John that he didn't understand either mm. uh, about love and about truth and about you know free will and, and other principles that he didn't understand because he hadn't received the love to understand it um, so for the first six months of my ministry that basically happened um, until John was captured by Herod and that that um Biblical account is correct? Pretty accurate, yeah. John... Um, it was Herod's wife who... Was it? Or, or sort of stepdaughter, yeah, um, who who really asked... Who did the dancing and his wife asked for his head. And His wife was really annoyed with John, really angry with oh. John, because John had very outspokenly... I talked to him about it a lot of times. I said, why are you... Why are you worried about this man and his personal relationship with this woman? And John was just really upset about it. And so John used to get very outspoken about Herod's relationship with his wife, which was actually an adulterous, under the, under the terms of Judaism, okay. an adulterous relationship. Mm. So John would rave on about it. And eventually Herod got, Herod, well, Herod's wife, Herod didn't care less. He'd been accused of adultery many times <laughs> previous. But Herod's wife got sick of it. And so Herod's wife really instigated John's capture. And John's capture was even interesting because Herod didn't have jurisdiction where John currently was because um, it, it, it was across the Jordan. And, and, so, um, and so Herod sent uh, a group of his personal guard dressed up in plain clothes, if you like, nabbed John from one side of the Jordan took him to the other side and then they got dressed and captured him and <laughs> took him back um, and then threw him in prison. So you witnessed all of this? I didn't witness it. I was told it by John's no. followers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't witness it. Yeah, because we were at this stage talking in different locations. Well, that must have upset you a fair bit at the time. Um, no, I thought it was predictable. I, I thought it was going to happen because of John's complete disregard to my advice to stop talking about it and stop mm. involving himself in Herod's life uh, and John just couldn't let it go and mm. I, I just thought sooner or later John there would be some pretty negative consequences happen we, we were both aware too of negative spirits you know dark spirits around us who would often instigate things and against us and and you know I'd often talk to John look all you're doing is playing into their hands you know and as it turned out that's what happened mm. So, um, yeah, I wasn't saddened by it. It was, it was a fairly predictable event yeah. from my perspective. Mm. Um, John was a little shocked about it, but, which I heard about after he passed. Because mm. when John passed, he came and talked to me straight away, pretty much, and told mm. me all the events. And, yeah. Okay, now, was this before you started your teaching? No, this was like six months into it. Six months into it. So you had a bit of a following by this stage? A bit of a following. John's followers didn't... Yeah, a lot of John's followers sort of didn't gravitate to the divine truth because they had more of a natural love perspective and they had a lot of John's latent anger with authority. So that's what attracted them to John and that's why the Romans were a little... and the Jewish Sanhedrin was a little concerned with John because they, they thought that he would eventually become a radical, not understanding that he was also a pacifist. Um, and so they were often concerned that he might finish up leading some kind of revolt because of the amount of people that were surrounded us. And quite mm -hmm. often when John spoke, there were quite a number of Roman uh, members of the Roman army present to keep order just mm -hmm. in case things got out of hand. And they never did um, because John was not a violent man. So mm -hmm. they never did. So um, after a while, I started attracting a different group of people than John. Um, but initially, yes, a lot of them were John's followers who, who followed me mm. initially and then couldn't handle some of the teachings. And so they, so they went back to following John. So what was the main focus of your teaching in those early days? Divine love, receiving divine love. Um, demonstrating to a person the process of how you can become born again, how... how divine love transforms the human soul from man into an angel there's a reference of you talking about satan did you talk about satan no 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 i never believed in a satan um not at all i often talked about uh 
devils or demons, mm. uh, which we call them, which was the common term for uh, spirits who would overcloak people in disastrous and very negative ways. So I did talk about devils and demons, mm. um, but not one ruler of the demons or ruler of the devil, the devil, yeah. ruler of the demons, because there was no such creature, no such person. Mm. Mm. Now, when did you first start healing? As soon as I was at one with God, uh, pretty much. Um, what do you remember the first time? The very first time was Peter's mother, actually. Um, Peter's mother? What was wrong with her? Peter's mother had a... Um, um, what do you call it now? It's appendix, appendicitis. And um, her appendix was about to burst. And back then that was a death sentence, pretty mm. much. Um, and um, I healed that overnight. Um, How did you do that? Just by laying my hands on her and praying for her and and just telling her that she needed to be open and have some faith about it happening. Mm. And by the morning she was completely cured. Yeah. So Peter then became pretty outspoken. <laughs> and so Peter, you know, Peter because came... Because he witnessed this. He witnessed that, yeah. And it was so, his mother-in-law. So he actually, thought you had yeah. power now. He thought I had power now, so now it was worth yeah. listening to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, there were some events that occurred with fish, which was Peter's primary interest. Um, you know, that's what he made his living from, um, where I predicted where there'd be fish, and sure enough, there was fish there and so forth. It was a pretty easy thing to do, but mm. um, he then viewed this as some kind of marvellous, mm. miraculous event. Uh, which then gave him a bit more faith that I might have known what I was talking about with other things. Uh, so John, James, Peter witnessed all of those events. Andrew, um, Peter told Andrew. They were all living in Capernaum or near Capernaum at the time. Or in John and James' case, their father lived across across the Galilee on the direct opposite side. And who else did you heal that's not in the Bible? Or, or... Oh, there's hundreds not in the Bible. Thousands probably not in the Bible. Um, yeah. Can you recollect another event? Um, well, all events had similar flavours where they were basically a combination of different things that have occurred to the person. Generally, it was either a spirit overcloaking that had caused the person's body to degrade in a certain location where the spirit was connected to the body due to the emotion. And, and once... Once I removed the spirit and I could heal the actual location and the person was cured basically instantly. But then I would talk to them about their emotions and what had actually happened, the, the attraction, you know, what, what had actually occurred, why they had got the disease that they had that they had gotten or why they'd gotten their spirit attraction. But why is there not much in the Bible and in, in the Gospels about you're talking about this law of attraction and, and well, because how most emotions of the, can cause illness. Most of the people didn't understand what I was talking about. So there's a general process with most humans, and that is if you, if you don't understand something, you don't say that you didn't... You don't relay it exactly as it was and then say, I've got no idea what that means. What you try to do is you try to make it into something you do understand or you don't say anything about it at all. Mm. That is a general human condition, unfortunately. So, so what finished up happening was that there were certain things that they felt they could understand or that were startling in nature, um, you know, so, so-called so resurrections from the dead and so forth, and, and they would then put those particular things into the text. But the actual original writings of Mark, Matthew and, and Luke, they, are all, they all did contain far more events of those kinds. But but further revisionists didn't understand them. They they didn't get them, and so they, they just left them out. So they left them be, you know, to the things that they did understand. And also back then, writing was a difficult process. It wasn't easy like we have it today, mm -hmm. um, where you can write thousands of pages within a few days, just you know, with the help of a computer, or even if you'd had paper. Back mm -hmm. then, even putting together papyri was difficult. Um, you know, it's a difficult, long-winded process. Getting the mm. utensils to write was difficult. Then carrying it around was difficult again, and so it was only the very rich that could afford such things. 
and most of the disciples and apostles were very poor mm -hmm. and so you know they didn't have the means to 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 do that so a lot of the things that were eventually related years later were were limited in nature because of the limitation of of financial matters mm -hmm. really uh, of the people involved yeah. okay I'm going to um, just mention a few um, things that are biblical terms that you still use today can I perhaps just have a pause and I yeah. go to the toilet and then <laughs> <laughs> and we can continue